episode four. I'm in the wrong pocket. I don't like this. Why am I here? Kamo said from within Saku's garment. Saku switched Kamo and Fushichao physicians in the dark, not far from the gambling den. The area was silent after the events earlier in the day. Han never turned from peering over the wall of the housing complex, keeping an eye out for Ito's men. She tilted her head and brought her lips forward. A strange, sparkly breeze passed through the air. Hairs on Saku's head stood up. What have I done, Kamo? Saku said, not noticing anything but her own thoughts. She crossed her arms tightly and gripped her hands. Actually, I like the other pocket better, I said. Hana smiled like she thought Saku was playing a strange game with her. Kamo, it's only us here. Saku pulled the skull from her pocket. Here it is. I can hear a soul inside this skull. Hannah screamed, but then covered her mouth. I'll admit this isn't the best of look, but that was uncalled for, he said. Saku, we need to get as far away from my husband in this city as possible. He might change his mind after a few days, and his, his mood might blow over. I know I was late, Saku said, but I have done nothing to deserve this. Nothing, Hannah said, leaning harder against the wall, tugging on her kimono sleeves. You hurt his military commander and his son. You are aligned with Ayashi, the one Lord Yatak who blames for the death of his son from his wife before me. And you saved me from the kissing house. Saku lowered her eyes. I have nothing to do with Ayashi. I need to fix this. That's not how anyone sees it now, Hannah said. Please listen to me. This goes deeper than you know. I cannot let you go to Lord Latoku. I once pledged my life to th serve the Nikol. I served as a shrine maiden to a shaman until I came of age. Until my family gave me to Lord Latoku. To settle a dispute. He is quick to take revenge for the most petty things. It's not only you in danger. It's everyone. The people here, Lord Yataku's enemies, and your village. What dispute, Saku said. Hana was taken aback. Over land, your village. The matter was settled until my brother did what my brother does. This is why you cannot go tonight. Your brother, Saku asked. Hana wiped her face with the hem of her garment and patted her skin to remove some of the makeup. Some of the white paint remained on her forehead and cheeks. She felt her skin. Ayashi is my brother. The son of Lord Noriko of the North, she spoke, closing her eyes. He was given to Lord Yataku in the arrangement as a warrior. He was disowned when he killed Lord Yataku's son in battle. I cannot fail Mibu, Saku said. I'm not leaving without a solution. You won't be failing your village, Hana said. I promise. Get me somewhere safe for a little while, and then we can return to the castle. I can train you to use that sword, and I... I can prepare you for this fight. Saku looked to the stars. A loud bell tolled across the city. Anna gasped. It rang repeatedly. A long-held note blasted from a multitude of horns far away. Windows and doors shut. Slowly, the light from the surrounding city ceased until the sky was pitch black. Is it time to work? Saku asked. No, Anna said. Lord Yataku has locked down the city. There will be men at all the exits. They aren't going to let us leave. We can try to find a place to hide in the city until we can find a way out and... Saku again looked at the stars. My parents were taken from me by the conquerors when I was young, which happens to all the children who are allowed to live in my village. But I met my mom once. We snuck off in the night and watched the stars. She told me she knew her mother 
who used to only tell certain stories when certain stars could be seen. That was the only time where people could share the tales. I hated how long they were. But now, I wish I could listen. Because I don't remember the stories she told. No one knows the stories anymore. Yet my village sings the praises of the conquerors for saving them. Life is a gift that has been taken from us. I don't want to be silenced anymore. Go wherever is safe, Hana. Get out of the city as soon as you can. Saku tighten her hair tie. I wish you the best of luck. Saku, no, I said. You cannot do this. You are weak. He will make an example of you. You need to come with me and... Can you send word for him to meet me at the warehouses? Saku said, keeping the tea bag over her back shoulder. Hannah nodded. Until we meet again. Or... In the next life, if nothing else. In Saku? We still need Lord Yataku. Because if my father gains control, you won't have a village to go back to. Saku paused before adjusting the bag on her back. She disappeared into the night. Three guards came out of the darkness and surrounded Saku, who stood in the middle of the warehouse. She drew her sword. Her heart pounded. A deep voice echoed through the large room, surrounded by bins and shelves of goods. She recognized the voice. I've been told your name is Sakura. Your head isn't very good, is it? Put the sword down. He appeared, catching Saku off guard. He adjusted his hair in his top knot and motioned for a young woman to approach. She handed him a pipe and incense, which he lit and smoked. He exhaled and handed the object back to the geisha, blowing smoke into the air. He tightened the sash on his red kimono. You should do as he says for now, Shichao advised. Saku lowered the sword, but did not put it in its sheath. What did you think would happen here tonight, Saku, he said. I plead with you, she said. Please do not let my actions affect my village. My fault is my own. I will do whatever it takes to make things right in your eyes. Lord Yataku crossed his arms. His guards looked at each other. I'll let you explain to me, your regent, why you feel you do not deserve death. For allowing me to show our enemies such weakness. Why should your village go unpunished? The ones who sent such an incompetent little girl. I shall entertain your answer. Ayashi stole it from me, Saku said. I had to track it down. My village did nothing wrong. They sent you, he said. This is the third time the delivery did not arrive. You were unacceptably late which is none of my concern. But then I hear, Saku, that my doctor tells me that my daimyo needs special herbal treatment because of something you did. A leaf that grows not in this area. I know you not, but you somehow have become a menace that I cannot let stand. What if I find you this leaf, Saku asked, to make things right? Then I will return to my village, and you will have no dealing with me from here on out. Saku tightened the grip on her katana. I need no help from a skull person, Lord Yataku spoke. A guard offered him a sword, which he took. I do not accept failure. Let me do it for you, the guard said. I can handle a 16-year-old woman, Lord Yataku said, smacking the guard. I'm 26, Saku said. She pulled the sword back to face upright and found her center. Standing shoulder length apart, he held the sword high and sideways in the air and rushed at Saku, letting out a cry. With the flick of Saku's top wrist, she swung up hard, hitting an exposed elbow. Blood gushed. He cried out in pain and took the sword in his left hand. A guard came to his side, but he used the edge of the hilt to hit the man on the head. 
She backed away and dove into one of the long aisles. Yataku crossed after her. Saku had run to the end of the row, looking back to see Lord Yataku, tucking his elbow into his ribs. He winced in pain, but walked towards her. Saku quickly took Kamo out of her pocket, stood on her tippy toes, and placed him on top of a shelf high above. From the corner of her eye, she spotted the regent. He swung. The blade hit Saku's shoulder and cut her garment and slashed at her skin. She sprinted past Saki barrels and ducked down out of sight. While he searched for her, she placed Fushichao on a pallet stacked with perfume crates. She reached and grabbed a hold of the top shelf. The bare soles of her feet bounced off the bamboo as she leapt into the air. Before she could gain her footing, Yataku caught her with his other injured arm and yanked her off. She grabbed at his elbow as she fell towards the ground. He let go. Saku cleared out of the row. He stood, bleeding, still searching for her. Fuchicho shouted, Don't go that way! He's headed in your direction! Kamo chimed in, His guards aren't doing anything either. You should be able to run out of here if you can get away. Saku jumped to a shelf, but the top plank snapped in half. She was able to straddle the top, but Lord Yataku saw her. Before she could react, he threw his sword at her. She ducked, but could no longer hold her balance, especially with the T on her back. Fall sent her head first to the ground, with the katana still in her hand. Her vision blurred. He approached where she lay and picked up his sword. Before he could swing at her, she stood to her feet and slashed at the shelf, sending paper goods and jewelry flying. Arms reached out and pulled herself through to the other side. Once she had crossed, she turned back away, facing the cut she had made. She readied her sword. A kneecap came into view. She slashed. She felt her left foot slip on the dirt from the weight of the swing. With his left hand, Lord Yutaku swung down. The swords clanked. Saku pressed the blades towards his face. Her blade was close to touching his cheek. Trying to muster all of her strength, she pushed with her right hand on the katana, but in doing so, her feet slipped. She felt the sword leave her fingers. She fell. After impact, Saku twisted back around, looking up, discovering Lord Yataku above her. She removed the bag of tea from her back. Blood dripped from Saku's face. She stared, not blinking. His brow narrowed. He pointed the edge of the blade at her heart. Saku's elbow jerked back. She threw the bag of tea at Lord Yataku and screamed. With every single inch of soul and being, her throat went raw as it burned as she yelled. Thunder clapped. The air filled with static. A flash blinded them as lightning cracked through the thatched roof. The bolt struck Yataku. His body fell to the ground like a rag doll. Saku stood to her feet, but her knees buckled. Her mouth dropped. She put weight on the bamboo shelf. Her head felt dizzy. Her body was faint. A voice cried from the other side of the warehouse. I told you you could shoot lightning from the sky, but no, don't believe Kamo. Is he all right? asked Fushichao. Lord Yataku lay with half his face in the dirt. His hair sprawled out in chunks on the ground. Saku shook her head. I don't think so. The guards closed in. Help, she called to them. What do I do? Somebody help him. The guard did nothing. Another approached and looked down to his leader. They crossed their arms almost at the same time. Saku grabbed Fushichao from the shelf and ran to the other end to collect Kamo. She put the skulls in her pocket and exited the warehouse. Once outside, Saku panicked, finding a corner and making herself small. She saw someone running in the darkness towards her. She backed further into the small space. Lights in the city began to be lit. Soon, she could see Onichan in front of her, with his hands and feet bound in rope. She went to him and cut the ropes and sheathed the sword. She cried, standing in front of him, swollen, broken. What happened? he asked.
The guards heard something, then gave up and let me go, Oni Chan said. Water boiled in a pot on top of a lit fire in the hut. The sounds of chaos could be heard outside with the Mizumano performers and the rest of the city learning the news about the daimyos and the regent's death. I ran from the castle as fast as I could, Oni Chan went on. Do you mean that you have taken down both Lord Yataku and the daimyo in the same evening? He walked to the pot and wet the cloth in hot water. Yes, Saku said. Hana gasped. Once my father hears of this, he will try to take control of Sal Song. There is no town guard left either, Li Chan said. There is no one to protect the city other than his forces, most of whom are off aiding the northwest. Saku refused Oni Chan's help. The guards did not come to Lord Yataku's side when the lightning struck him. They stood there, willing to watch a living man die. Wait, Oni Chan said. He got hit by lightning. Now you've got the master talking the animals in your set, Kamo said to her. Saku sighed. I think the tea has given me these powers. Are you sure you don't want an exhibit in this Mizumano? Onichan said. Once you have overthrown the city and taken control before the forces of the North do, no one will remember Oniku. You can't be serious, Hana spoke. She hid her arms in her kimono and rocked back and forth on her feet. Saku stood and paced the floor. Her legs were weak and stiff, but she managed to walk to the other side of the room. She reached inside the large wooden barrel Filling a pitcher, she drank from it with both hands gulping. She slammed it on the table. Her gaze turned to the crackling fire. She held a solution to fix everything. <laughs>